it's wonderful to see everyone reconnecting and hugging each other and talking. Uh, but we have a program, an exciting program coming up today. So first of all, for those of you who don't know me, I am Anna Olson. I am Interim Executive Director at the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. And we, uh, uh, all of our staff together, have organized these workshops uh, with a lot of wonderful presenters along the way. And um, so before we get started with this first August Faculty Workshops lunch today, um, also, by the way, welcome over there is a the camera. To those of you who are joining us via Zoom, we have about 30, uh, moving towards 40 uh, participants on Zoom. Uh, if you have a chance, or whenever you have a chance uh, today, tomorrow, next week, uh, please fill out the evaluation form. So those of you who are here in person, you have them on the table. Uh, CTRL really appreciate, as well as our presenters do, having the feedback uh, from the participants for the session. So uh, the one or two minutes it takes is really valuable. So thank you for doing that. For online participants, you'll get a link in the chat. And now, without further ado, I want to welcome Amanda Taylor. And Amanda is going to introduce the panel. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. Um, so good to see so many faces here in the Butler boardroom, familiar faces, new faces. Welcome to AU for those of you who are joining us and welcome back to the semester. For those of you who are back, we are so happy to be in community here. Welcome to those of you online. Really glad you're joining us today. Um, I'm Amanda Taylor, she, hers pronouns. Um, I'm lucky enough to serve as the Assistant Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion here at AU. I'm also a faculty member in the School of International Service and really, really happy to be um, in conversation with some incredible colleagues here um, on this panel and with all of you today as we sort of launch this new year and really anchor ourselves in our students. You know, we all know that our students are the lifeblood of what we do, they are our heart. And how do we understand some of the context that they're bringing um, to this new year, some of the uh, the, the things that, that are, they're swimming in. What is the water that our students are swimming in, right? And how might that inform how we all engage with our students over the course of this year, whether we are faculty members and we're teaching full-time, whether we're staff members who are, who are teaching um, our students in other ways, how do we connect with the broad context and understand the broad context in a way that really informs how we all work together towards our goals for student thriving? We say that a lot. What does it mean for students to thrive? Um, what does it mean for students to belong here at AU? And how are we all really intentional about being partners with each other in this work, right? And so what we're hoping to do today is hear from this, again, excellent group of panelists here to my left, to your right, who are going to introduce themselves um, as, we, as we go along. But I just want to sort of say, they're gonna frame out a conversation for us across a couple of dimensions, right? Who, who are our student body and how do we think about bringing our student body here to campus? What are some of the considerations, the processes? Um, what does that look like? So my two colleagues to, to my left here, Ellen and Andrea will speak to you about the kind of um, undergraduate enrollment life cycle and how that works. And then also what are some of the, the demographics um, of our new class? Right? What does that look like? How can you understand that as you move into this new semester? And then my next two colleagues um, are Raymond and Bridget. They're going to speak to you a little bit about the, the sort of context of what does it mean to engage with our students, to thrive? What are some of the characteristics of this, this generation? Right? How do we connect with our students inside and outside of the classroom in ways that really make them feel seen, feel whole, and feel like they belong as a part of this place? And then we're gonna close out with our wonderful colleagues, Jimmy and Ashley, who are gonna talk again about the intentional work we're doing to really support student thriving on this campus and how we think about that really strategically. And we think about this whole process as a cycle, right? And then I'm gonna offer one question to the panel um, where I'll ask them to, to suggest to you based on what they said, what is one thing they would want our faculty and staff who are gathered with us today to know or to do? as a result of this conversation. One sort of takeaway for each of you. And then we'll open it up to Q&A for all of you who are here in the room and for those of you who are online. So that will be our kind of process for today, but we really wanna make this a conversation. Um, we don't wanna talk at you. All of the knowledge that we need is really shared and collective in this room. So we wanna set some framing, but then also really um, welcome you to think through what are some questions you have? What are some, some ways that you might enter the conversation so that when we open it up, um, you are ready to engage in all the ways. 
So with that, um, let me turn it over. Oh, actually, could I ask, Lindsay, would you mind showing this slide here? Um, I'm very proud of this uh, set of pictures that I that I pulled here from everyone's gorgeous uh, LinkedIn profiles and others. But for many of you, you may not have had the great chance to meet some of these colleagues uh, over here to my left who are new to AU, but not new to this work and have really been incredible partners to us, as well as some longstanding colleagues here at AU. So um, here are their names and titles. They will introduce themselves to you as we move along. But just to give you a sense of how you might pair names with faces moving forward and know who to reach out to if you've got follow-up questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Evelyn and to Andrea to, to kick us off. Um, and Andrea, if you could also introduce yourself and say your role at AU before you jump in. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Felder, and um, I serve as Vice Provost for Undergraduate Enrollment. What does that mean? Um, I work with very closely with our admissions and financial aid teams. We also do enrollment marketing um, within our office to bring in our new students. Um, so I think, Lindsay, are you advancing the slides? Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of context of who will be coming into us this fall. We'll start first with our first year students. Um, see some stats here. Um, within our first year class, we anticipate that this is about 100 students more than came in last year as first year students. Um, we're very proud of the class that we brought in for the fall semester. Um, but I do wanna take you back a little bit and provide a context, additional context beyond what's on the screen of who these students are. Um, so go back to 2019, August, September of 2019. These students started their first year in high school in a world that was seemingly normal. They went to class. They did not have to wear masks. They didn't have to do testing. Um, so they started in fall 2019, and, and then in their spring of their first year in high school, that's when the world shut down for the pandemic. Um, so you'll see differences in our students because they are coming from all over, literally coming from all over the U.S. and around the world. They may have experienced differences in their classroom environment. So depending on which state they may have come from, they could have very quickly gone back to the classroom in the fall of their sophomore year, or they may have continued to be online throughout their entirety of their sophomore year and probably part of their junior year in high school. So these students may have just come back now in their senior year back to a traditional classroom environment where they're not having to be tested every single week, having to wear a mask, having to social distance. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're thinking about the students and their learning differences not necessarily in the respect of how they may learn just generally speaking, but in terms of learning loss that they may have experienced, uh, their experience in particular in math and writing courses um, and what that might look like for those students that are coming in for our first year. Um, so just wanted to provide that level of context. Um, but as you can see, it is a diverse class. Um, those of you who have seeing me pre present this information in the past. I'm, I'm proud of that male female number. We're inching a little bit closer to getting a few more males on campus um, in our first year class. That number is usually closer to 35% uh, uh, male um, in the class as well, the diversity, um, and we remain committed to in, uh, ensuring that we have a diverse class, both racially, ethnically, as well as students who are the first in their families to attend uh, college. Um, so if you'll go to the next slide, you'll see our transfer population. Um, so this is inclusive of both our internal transfers, those students who we consider as part of the International Accelerator um, or the American Collegiate Program. So you'll see a, a, on this slide a noted difference in the international percentage. Um, that's reflective of those students who are internally transferring into AU through our Shorelight programs. As well, about 65% of our transfer students are coming from another four-year college or university. Uh, so majority of the students coming in as transfers are coming from a four-year college, um, but we do have a large number of students coming from two-year colleges as well. Um, many of those two-year colleges are those that you can imagine that are surrounding this community. So Montgomery College, as well as Northern Virginia Community College. Also very diverse group of students, and they're also very academically prepared. So that GPA is a, on a 4.0 scale from college, um, so a 3.2 uh, GPA. So I'm going to pause there and turn it over to my colleague, Evelyn, who's going to introduce herself and talk a little bit more about um, life cycle management, but would be happy to answer questions as we go along about our class and what they look like. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Good 
afternoon, everybody. I have not met many of you. I see just a couple of familiar faces. I am Evelyn Thimba, um, new vice president for enrollment um, in the Office of Enrollment, and really excited to be joining AU. This is week five uh, for me, not that I'm counting, but I'm really excited to be to be here with you all. So I think my task this afternoon was really to a, introduce myself and perhaps talk a little bit about my background, but also just talk about this um, idea of student life cycle that um, has already taken shape here at AU, but we are doubling down on this as we, um, as we continue to think about who we are bringing in, how we are supporting them, and how we are graduating them. So I, I'm joining AU from Drexel University, where I served uh, for seven and a half years as, um, as a chief enrollment officer there. And prior to Drexel, I was at NYU for 17 years, all in roles in the Office of Admissions, undergraduate admissions, um, and, and NYU is also my alma mater. So I was there for quite a while. But my, my time at, at both at NYU and Drexel really uh, are, can be defined by the work that we did on, uh, on, on advancing access and opportunity, but also the work that we did in thinking about how, how, the, how the, the um, processes and the practices that we develop in the admissions office impact retention and graduation, because we know that uh, at its core, retention is really uh, a, a, a function of two specific things, is who we are bringing in and then how we are supporting them. And a lot of time and attention is spent on talking about how we are supporting them. Um, and maybe not as much time has been spent on talking about who we are bringing in, how we are telling the story, how we are building that awareness about AU, and then also how we are building in their expectations of what they're going to be finding here and how we end up meeting or not meeting those expectations. And so uh, my, our team is going to be really thinking critically about how we, how we um, include uh, uh, in our predictive models proje uh, retention projections for students even as we are crafting that class to ensure that at least on the front end, we're working very deliberately to bring a class that will thrive here and succeed as well. I think one of the things that we'll be talking about, my understanding is that reader training is in October or end of October. So the training that um, Andrea and the leaders in our admissions team uh, perform to, to get, get our admissions officers prepared to review applications and, and make uh, decisions, that's going to be happening in October. Prior to that, we wanna work with you all and with all of the university, all of the colleges and schools to really understand what, is, what are the characteristics of students who are succeeding in our classrooms um, can we look at the data that will sh the, and look at how students who are not perhaps um, who are having challenges in the classroom, what what is their profile look like? And can we adopt some of those things to make sure that we are having our, our admissions officers look out for the red flags and or look out for areas of excellence that perhaps we've been missing as we are evaluating um, candidates. But at the core of all of this conversation is to say that retention, um, student success is impacted by each and every one of us in here. Everything that we do, everything that um, every 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 way in which that every in every way that in which that we work with students, um, this impacts whether or not they'll be successful here in our classroom. So looking at the entire life cycle and seeing where, where, where your primary focus or where your primary impact is, and then thinking about how um, secondarily or even tertiarily your, your, the work that you do impacts student success, success is really going to be important for us as we are building out this whole student life cycle model. Right now, our teams are getting ready to hit the road. So our first admissions counselor hits the road next this week or next week she's heading out to India and very shortly thereafter, there'll be a wave of us hitting the road and telling the AU story. So in the, in the life cycle here, 
We are the, uh, you know, aware, awareness, marketing and recruitment. That's where our team is, but you all are in the matriculation and onboarding piece of it for this first year class, but also all of these other places, all of these other um, points on this, uh, on, this, um, on this journey for all of our returning, returning students and how, how like I, I'm just gonna go back to the beginning and say how we tell that story, the expectations that we are going to be sharing um, for to prospective students is so critical to how they decide whether they decide to apply to Drexel to American. She got caught. We do not. We only have the record. Strike it from the record. Only eagles here. How we how we recruit our future eagles into future alumni. Um, but but I, I think uh, you know the the connection between expectation setting and expectation meeting is 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 a big part of that retention conversation. So I just want to wrap up with 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 that, and I should stop before I. <clears throat> okay, now I'm really scared to say um, uh, the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is Raymond Blooming O. Uh, I go by the He series, and I am ecstatic to be here. Um, I'm the Vice President of Student Affairs, and that's a fancy way of saying that, it, that I'm working with a wonderful team of student-facing staff members that oversee health and counseling, um, student activities, student engagement, um, diversity inclusion of the Dean of Student Affairs office and many other offices as well. Um, and uh, some of the things that we encounter in the office could range from conduct related issues to crisis management. But I also want to emphasize that one of the reasons I'm particularly excited to be here is the emphasis on holistic student development. That's, uh, that's ultimately what we are um, aiming for is to help our students thrive holistically. So not just academically, but socially, um, and certainly intellectually, spiritually, uh, and also physically, of course. And speaking of which, that picture that you saw was when I was about 10 pounds lighter, um, two jobs uh, uh, you know, ago. But I actually think I look much better in my AU picture here. So uh, so, uh, terrific uh, photographer. So, um, I'm going to hand it over to Bridget now so she can in introduce herself, and then we're going to actually tag team back and forth to talk a bit about the characteristics of some of the things that you might be seeing in your classroom, and then Bridget is going to be talking specifically about some strategies and the implications for classroom work. Bridget? Okay. So, I love that Raymond said one of my favorite words, which is holistic, right? I also say ecosystem a lot. Um, because that's what we are. And that's one of the things that I really like about AU. So we've both been here seven weeks. So together we have 14 weeks of experience as Eagles, uh, if you want to do that math. So um, I'm Bridget Trogdon, a Dean of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Services. And so the unit is kind of the undergrad arm of academics. And I think sometimes of things like undergraduate education and academic student services as the horizontal. So often you have the colleges that are building up through the majors, the graduate schools, the epistemologies, uh, and we work on the things that don't belong to any one college. Um, and so, but, you know, very much in line with holistic student development. So there's no kind of student affairs side of the house, academic affairs side of the house. We're all the same house and we all work together. And um, I, I do come from the faculty. I've been a professor. This is year 19 as a professor. Um, I do have a tenured appointment here as well in the School of Education because that's the kind of research that I do, but my doctorate is in chemistry. I know there's some chemists in the house. They always say, they always say woo woo and stuff like that. Um, and you know, I, I really come from that academic background of working with students as well. So we're gonna tag team now. I love it, okay. Wonderful. Um, uh, as some of you may remember, I believe it was a couple of months ago, um, but um, I believe it was actually in, at Cornell uh, the student government wanted to pass a resolution uh, that would require faculty to have trigger warnings in their syllabi. Did anyone hear about that, right? And then what did the president say? 
right. The president said, absolutely not. And I think a number of educators like ourselves felt empowered to be able to um, you know, draw a line in the sand. Um, but that is indicative of some of the trends that we're, we're seeing in the population. And I want to be very clear, these are not necessarily good or bad uh, characteristics. And we also don't want to categorically say all students you're going to encounter will have these characteristics. But one of the books that I love reading um, is the author Jean Twingy. She teaches at uh, San Diego State, and she's done a lot of research on the different generations. Um, and I know Bridget also has several authors that, that she often refers to. And one of the things that she talks about is that there are distinctive generational differences because of technology, for instance, and what has happened in the world. So it's in that context that I wanted to share with you some of the characteristics that we're seeing. And then I'm going to turn it over to Bridget so she can tell you about all of the possible things that you might wish to do. One of the first things that we see, besides the whole trigger warning, that's one of the trends that we see, is a number of our students uh, coming into the doors today uh, tend to have an a, um, external versus internal locus of control. Essentially what that means is they feel less empowered in many ways. So they may be coming to you saying, what are you going to do to fix this? Um, that deadline, what are you going to do? I can't meet that deadline. So there's a um, there's at times a defeatist uh, attitude and also tendency to attribute um, uh, attribute those sources of distress externally, that there's less of, of a self-empowerment of what can I do uh, for that. Uh, and of course, you can imagine that can contribute to general pessimism and tendency toward negativity. So that is something that we appear to be seeing in the data. Okay, so along with that, um, if you know, not to be Debbie Downer, womp, 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 right? But if there are ways that students feel that external sense, sense of control rather than the internal sense of control, are there things that we can do in the classroom, um, in particular with grading and with feedback? Like there was just a really good session that was online. Um, Santiago Toledo is here, who was one of the people who was helping run it. Um, we're, we're, we're on the panel. Um, where you know it was about ungrading and specs grading and things like that. And so what is the philosophy on giving students feedback on their academic work? Is it just here's your grade, you hit the mark, you didn't, or is it you know feedback on how you can take this data and improve? Um, helping them to use that feedback to then alter their choices, which sometimes has to do with, you know, did you plan ahead of time? Uh, did you um, use the resources that are available to you, you know, the different kinds of things. Um, I, I tell students this all the time. I failed my first college chemistry test. I got a 57. It's sitting in my office over in Anderson Hall. I should frame it and put it on the wall, quite honestly. Um, and, you know, and it was because I didn't know the strategies that I needed to study. I had the social capital, not all of our students do, but I had the social capital to go to my professor um, and say, I don't know what happened. I studied. He said, how did you study? Nobody would ever asked me that before. And that helped me to make changes. And so, um, you know, that's one of the ways of, of working with those attitudes sometimes is helping put the ball back in the student's court, let them have more of that autonomy with their education where we can as the people who are creating the learning environment. Something else that we're seeing in, in the student body is, uh, in general, less healthy habits, uh, including that they get less sleep and also less physical exercise. Um, how many of you sleep with your iPhones right next to you, like your best friend or or significant or, or dog in my case or wh whatever, right? I, I know I do, and and I I can bet you most of our students do, and so every time it pings or if there is for I always have mine set on vibrate. Every time it vibrates, I take a look at it and then I look at what else is happening in the world and then I get a little depressed and I sort of try to go back to sleep. Um, there are many studies seeing, uh, saying how sleep deprived our students are. And sleep deprivation is uh, directly connected to poor mental health. And so we are definitely seeing um, some of those characteristics. And because social media is what it is now, many students prefer and are used to actually interacting in that arena versus going outside. 
uh, which is why um, I, we are always talking about holistic physical health, trying to get students to interact. But those um, characteristics have a direct uh, bearing on what you see uh, in the classroom. And so the, whenever I, I think about this point, I think, you know, what can we do? And there are many things, but one strategy that comes to mind is looking at issues of due dates and deadlines. Um, and is there some flexibility in those? I know there are lots of different pedagogical strategies. I'm sure CTRL can, you know, help with some of those as well. Um, but there's a difference between what I often instructors think of as rigor and what students think of as rigor. I've actually stopped using that word because there are a lot of problematic practices that hide behind it. Um, but often for the students, well, well I'm gonna say the other, as the instructor and you think rigor is, you know, I, we have certain standards, we want you to help to be able to meet those standards. Um, whereas students think sometimes rigor is just general hard assery, you know, of I'm not, I'm not going to take an exception. And I just think about in, in our own lives, you know, with the people that I work with, there are things that come up. There are cars that don't start, trains that don't run on time, children that get sick, you, you know, you get sick yourself, you know, whatever the things are. Um, and so, you know, are there ways that we can help the students balance what they need with the fact that sometimes there are some unhealthy habits? Um, one other thing I've done in the past is I don't want to read a paper that was written at 1 or 2 a.m. I just don't. It's not going to be, you know, at good quality typically because there's a whole lot about brain function that we're still learning. But um, if I have a paper that is due on Canvas, I will often ask for it to be due by midnight you know, which again, isn't great, but um, that sometimes then helps the students to plan ahead, but then also realize there are some deadlines that wiggle in either direction. There are also some fascinating patterns related to how today's students prefer to communicate with one another and also with parents um, and also with administrators like myself. I'll never forget, not at Drexel, but at Tufts University, sorry. Um, at, at Tufts University, where I used to work, um, now it's almost eight or nine years ago, I'll never forget the time that I was talking to a student and the entire time, they were also texting at the same time. Now, the fact that they could do it at the same time, it, it was already baffling to me. But the fact is, and they said, you know, and then the parent knew they were having a meeting with me. Of course, why wouldn't they, right? Because they told the parent everything. And uh, so that's also another trend that we see. But, the, but what was fascinating to me was the parent tried calling the students so they could join us and the student kept putting them on just, uh, you know, they just kept, kept hanging up. And then I said, so what's going on? He said, well, I prefer to actually talk to my mom via text. And I thought that was really fascinating um, and which connected with what I was experiencing at another previous institution at Brandeis University. I would, uh, may have two students uh, in different clubs or roommates who might be sitting in the waiting area and they might, they would prefer to text one another than to actually talk in front of me to try to mediate a conflict. And so what we do know from um, the incoming population and what the stats show us that many of our students prefer online communication um, and also they prefer social media. They prefer sometimes telling the, the world rather than one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and also they have uh, almost an interpersonal deficit in that they have fewer social interactions, which uh, have also been amplified uh, by the pandemic. And all of these factors, we speculate that they in, uh, contribute to increased sense of loneliness, lack of sense of belonging and feelings of isolation. And so when you see that in your lecture hall or in your lab, um, we suspect that it's one of the reasons, um, uh, one of the results of the differences in the communication patterns that we see. And that, and that's, that's a big one. And I don't have all the answers for that either. I'm hoping maybe when we have some panel time, we can talk about that a little of how to, you know, communicate with students. Um, a couple of things that I've, I've thought about and I've done myself is work some on multimodal kinds of, of communication with students. Like if you're teaching a class that is fully online, um, rather than just communicating in, you know, written word, uh, every now and then can you, you know, create a video with captions for that that convey something to students. Um, you know, you can give feedback to students as a uh, voice thread um, and with, again, with, with captioning, just so students can hear sometimes what your tone is. And, and it's not just, oh my goodness, this is a flaming stink pile of work. You know, instead it's, 
hey, you have some really good things going on here. Let's let's talk about those. You know, let's look at some of the others. So are there different ways of communicating? Um, and and we also see this in class that the social skills are are often lacking. And if you're used to putting students in teams, in groups, in lab groups, in discussion groups, in turn to your neighbor and talk about this question, they might not do it. And so they're going to need a little bit of help with that. And I, I did because I'm a professor and a nerd. I, of course, brought my brought some books. Um, but one of them is a book that came out in 2020. It's called The Pandemic Population. And it's it's not the best, um, but it, it kind of speculated a little bit based on what we know about other generations like that lived through um, the pandemic flu about 100 years ago. And they but one thing I think is really useful, and this ties back to what Andrea was saying as well with the students that we have coming in now, our first time, full time, first year students who are 18 were first year in high school in 2019. That's that's a big change for them. And so the, that's almost a micro generation. And sometimes they're called the, a parenthetical population and they feel postponed, pushed aside, penalized and panicked. Um, and so that that shows up in the interpersonal interactions, in the anxiety. Um, and so, you know, whenever we can, finding different ways of communicating with the students can sometimes help. And there are certainly other characteristics, and we would also love to hear from you if time permits. But now we're going to turn to our colleagues. Hi, everybody. I'm Jimmy Ellis, Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education, and want to um, root into some of the things that are happening at our university that is being thoughtful of some of the observations that our colleagues are making and the practical ways that we're trying to improve, improve and iterate our various offerings. And I think this slide has been uh, on the screen for a while, so you, you've probably absorbed most of it <laughs> at this point. So I don't want to belabor the point. Um, but in each one of these things, you're seeing something that's been identified by someone that works with students as something that is deteriorating the foundation in which really good work can happen. And if we could improve that, make small changes, could we in fact settle the foundation and allow students, staff, faculty, and the community to feel firm uh, in that starting point, in that foundation, so we can continue to innovate and grow. Um, and these are examples of that. You know, one that is uh, pretty remarkable to me is the, uh, the one about uh, uh, major GPA requirements, number two. Um, that one, just in the past six months, there has been a, a, a university-wide commitment and uh, to uh, evaluating the GPA thresholds of what it takes to move internally from one academic unit, one major to another. And so what this solved for me as someone that works with first year students is that took away the kind of unearned benefit of having to have selected your major, your dream major um, when you came in. Um, that if you got that wrong or, or were off, like, like 40, 50% of our students do, that you had the same shot to get into an academic program that aligned with your interest as someone that happened to get that right in that uh, upon entry. What a, a, what a quality reckoning of that experience. What a realistic way to approach students as they're evaluating these different options. And it's, it's just a huge benefit. We're gonna see the benefits of that, I think very quickly. And we already are heading into this next academic year. I also wanna point out number five. Um, I have colleagues in the room and online from uh, academic advising. I can't help but smile when I see them because you know I, I work very closely with them. Um, and uh, for the past five years, AU has had an advising model that thought about the experience in professional or in um, uh, developmentally appropriate ways. Understanding that students in the first year require maybe more intense, more frequent, and more relationship-focused academic advising. Our first year advising office has been in place since 2018. Uh, for the past five years, that advising office has served the entire each individual academic advisor could potentially serve the entire range of academic units and academic majors. And so one person would have to be accountable for 70 plus majors. This year, we've sharpened that up uh, quite a bit. And in fact, most students now are gonna be aligned with an academic advisor that is aligned with a particular academic unit. And so if you are coming in attending SIS, you're gonna work with someone whose caseload is predominantly SIS at this point. And the, I think, Bring in all the benefit of the relationship-centered model that we have with it, uh, uh, first-year advising, and then layering that in with specificity and focus is a really nice enhancement that I'm looking forward to seeing how it plays out this year. And then for six is a natural bridge to my colleague, Ashley, to talk about um, the coordinated care network that we are continuing to develop under her guidance and, and our support. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Appreciate that. I love being able to say that. Yeah. Um, so. 
Folks, hi, I'm Ashley Prelo. I'm an assistant vice president for retention, student success, as well as student thriving. And trust me, we will unpack all that today. Um, one of the first things that I wanted to share is that I uh, started recently in February uh, where I was able to get my hands on quite a lot of data to really start to understand not only why are our students leaving, but why also are they staying? And so with that comes a conversation about retention. And so if I could, the folks that are sitting in this room right now, raise your hand if in the last six to 12 months you've been in a meeting where someone has brought up retention. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. I love to hear it. And we'll talk about why that's important, obviously, for economic reasons, for our university, right? It, it keeps our institution aligned with our students. We want to see those students be active. But it's the bridge to success, right? Retention is just one piece of the puzzle. And it is a mechanism in which we get indicators for whether or not our students are staying and being able to seek success, but it is not equal to a student having success, mm -hmm. nor does it connect or immediately or directly to a student's ability to thrive. When you think about retention, again, there are students that stay with us and there are students that leave. And when we understand both of those things, the, regardless of the number, we can start to drill into what does it mean for a student to be successful at American University. And when you think about the students that stay with us, right, there are a number of students that also transfer out, but you have to realize transferring in some senses is a privilege for a lot of our students. It takes time, it takes paperwork, access, right, opportunity. Um, and so even if we're retaining our students, we have to think critically about their ability to thrive while they're here, because again, retention does not equal success, nor does it equal thriving. And so what I like to do when I try to explain this concept around thriving is I start with our most marginalized students. I think about different populations that may struggle with their sense of belonging here or finding a sense of community, finding representation, having access to certain spaces, right? It's not just our first generation students. It's not just our underrepresented minority students, right? These are a number of students in different pockets of this university that if we can put them in the center of that circle and understand each part of their student life cycle, going back to what Evelyn was talking about before, then we have a greater chance of improving their entire experience and beyond. Right? So that's a concept that we have to be thinking about, not just outside the classroom, but certainly inside the classroom. And in order for us to do that and keep track of each of those pieces of what we're calling the student thriving pie, we have to identify our roles in what that piece is. And so if we can move to the next slide, this really connects to what Dr. Ellis was just talking about. And the coordinated care network piece, you know, since I started in February, I again got my hands on some data, started to talk to different offices, I recognized that we have an opportunity to coordinate not only the data, the knowledge, our workflows, technology, and the experts, our people, right, which is our biggest and best asset to be able to understand what it is about our students that we need to be paying attention to and when, right? And so when I think about the folks that are in this room, but also specifically our faculty members, we have to shine a flashlight on the fact that many of your students on average are spending up to 225 hours in a classroom with a certain faculty member compared to perhaps at best an hour with an advisor or more, depending on who you're meeting with, what college you're in, what program you're in. Um, and so because you all have that opportunity and that connection, we want to be able to coordinate better, right, as a university to lean into your expertise, what you're seeing, what signs um, of student success, but also student concerns. And in order for us to do this, I really think about you know, the committees that we have on campus. I think about centering the student voice and having that student voice kind of not echo in a bad way, but be passed along in a way that the people who can act on that change, that student-centered change, will have the power to do so with the knowledge that's presented to them. 
So it is important that we remain coordinated and improve on that coordinated care network as we move along. So if we move to the next slide, the last thing that I'll actually speak to is specifically the faculty role in student success at AU. Because the coordinated care model is um, a concept that many universities are either starting to adopt or continuing to improve over time. But when we drill down to the connection that these students are making with the faculty members here on campus, we gotta kind of take a step back. In some cases, that's the reason why they're here, right? Is the faculty, is the program, is the academics. Of course, there are a number of other pieces of that student experience that speak to them and the reasons why they're here with us. But the power that you all have to be able to develop these students, to be able for them to see you all as mentors, for you to have standards of academic excellence, which I know you all do very, very well, but it builds confidence when a student can be able to enter into that classroom, see the success real time, either on paper, online, whatever it may be, and then take that to their student organization meetings. Take that to also peer mentoring other students that are coming into our university. It comes full circle. So I really wanted to spell out all the different ways that faculty not only contribute to student success, but contribute to student thriving. If we focus on that, we will retain our students. So that is the last thing that I'll say. And I know we have some questions that, uh, Amanda, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks, thanks to the panel for setting the context and lots of different sort of ways that help us all connect to, to how we can play the role. And I love how you, you, you ended us. Ashley, we were joking about a mic drop moment. You did a nice job with your mic drop moment. Um, but I think I'll editorialize really quickly and then turn to our panel. And I will say, you know, the other layer to all of this, which I think was a thread through what we were hearing, but I want to sort of pull out as well, putting on my hat of, of inclusive excellence here at AU, right, is that these contexts vary for our students based on their identities, positionalities, and lived experiences. And they also vary for all of us in this room and, and on Zoom. Right. So we also need to think about, right, the ways that the context within which we work and how that's related to the environment that we're in here um, in this nation in this institution, right, are also showing up, right, when we talk about student thriving and who's got access and who doesn't to that opportunity. We talk about sort of enrollment and access and what that means and how intentional we have to be, especially in light of the current Supreme Court decisions to continue to really be affirmative right, about our commitment to this work, how that can show up in our classrooms, right, and in our, in our spaces um, outside of the classroom, our co-curricular spaces, right, in the ways that we really work to be um, intentional with our students and think about and attend to the various modes of strength that they all bring to us at this institution. So I'll stop there and on my editorializing, now turn back to my moderator hat and thank this group and say, you know, we all are, are about to launch in this semester and we've got a lot in our minds. I'm sure we all appreciated all of this context that you all shared with us. But I just wanna ask you, if you wanted to um, make sure that everyone in this room walked away with one nugget, one thing to do or to think about or to know based on what you just said, um, what would that be? Something to put in your pocket, take away and leave this room with. So we don't have to go in order. I'll kind of open it up as, as folks feel so moved. See and Andrea, yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind kicking it off. Um, you know, as, as Evelyn mentioned, our staff will be headed out on the road in the uh, next couple of weeks. Um, my one piece uh, or takeaway is just that this, this class is an academically talented, ready class. They may come in with different experiences as Amanda just pointed out, um, but I think that they're up for the challenge and challenge accepted. Um, they're up for the challenge. Um, and, you know, I think that they will come into your classrooms ready to be actively engaged in the classroom environment, asking those questions, ready to just be in, again, a, a traditional classroom space. Um, so that's my, my one piece. I'll jump in just to say I actually have two pieces of advice, if I, if I may give. Um, the first is, is very simple, and I'm saying this to students as well. Have a good time. Have fun. Sorry, um, uh, it really uh, enjoy, relish the opportunity to be able to teach your students. They're here for you and, and they're eager 
uh, to connect with you. And I think that really should be the thread through everything that we do. And it's easy to forget sometimes when we're looking at all of the different concerns and problems. Uh, and I know that for my team, I'm really trying to infuse what we do with the natural pleasure and joy that we get interacting with students in integrating with academic affairs and others so that there's a holistic experience. So please enjoy and relish this opportunity. And I think they will as well. They're very eager. Uh, the second thing is, um, and I know this sounds very strange coming from someone who is only seven weeks in, just like Bridget, but you're not alone in this. We are in it together. We are one institution. And my team, is certainly more than myself. Um, many of them are actually sitting in the audience right now. If there are concerns, please call us. If there are things we can do differently, if there are things that we can stop doing or start doing, we're here because we're all part of the same team and we would like to make sure that the, the classroom and lab and other experiences that you have with your students are as rich as possible. And we would like to be a partner with that. And with that, um, when challenges come um, around the corner, and they will, we will be ready for it, and we can find the answers together. Maybe come up with a new one. That's fine. Um, I, I do like to have fun. I actually, I, I like to put stickers on students' work sometimes and give it back to them. Just little star stickers go a long way. Um, mine is, and, and I'll, I'll just be really brief with it and then pass this on, because I want to hear what you all are thinking, too. Um, don't be stingy with praise. Uh, for me, one that comes to mind is um, uh, commit and recommit to students. Um, show them that, that you're there for them and, and know that that's going to burn fast because they're stressed, they're worried, they're thinking about the things. Recommit. A series of recommitments all semester long goes a long way to make the student feel like they belong and, and that you believe in them. And don't be afraid to experiment, right? I mean, the power of experimentation with this generation they're almost looking for that, right? A safe sandbox to play in. So I'll leave it at that because you all can think in your own ways how you could bring that into the classroom. So don't be afraid to do it. I, I'll have to, I just have a quick one. And also just building off of something that Raymond said on, on the same, on the same uh, train of thought of you're not alone. This, this work that we are doing is so interconnected. And for us in, in the Office of Enrollment, understanding what you're seeing with the students that are coming in and helping us identify where we can tell this story differently, where we can pull excellence in, 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 in the classroom more deliberately. So if you're, if you're encountering maybe trends in student and students, you're, you're seeing a, you know, a, a certain trend that perhaps we should know about as we are thinking about the work that we are doing, please let us know so that we, it's, it, you informing our work means that we're bringing in um, a class that, that we, can, we can teach and will succeed here. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so now our turn. Um, questions, comments? We've got Lindsay kindly up here. We'll bring the mic over to you. And if you don't mind speaking into the mic, if you feel comfortable saying your name so we can all get to know each other, that'd be great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for this panel. Uh, Karan Martinez. I am a faculty member and a staff member. I run the uh, Center for Professionalism and Communications in COGOD. Bridget, I would love to talk to you separately about one of your articles about the power skills and the essential skills of business that I just loved reading. Um, I have two comments and a question. Um, let me start with a comment. Some of our conferences over the summer, employers are telling us that they are looking less at GPA as an important vetting factor for that first job out of college and more at what they call holistic measures. So I think that's something to kind of take away. The, the, the difference in percentage is huge. Um, they were looking at GPA primarily 73% of them in 2018, and now it's down below 30%. So I think that's interesting for students also to kind of take the pressure off a little bit. I loved hearing about um, how we're looking at that. Uh, second comment is in the center that I run, which is a writing center that employs 48 undergraduate and graduate writing tutors and presentation coaches that are all students. We have a little bit of a forcing function now our hours to get tutoring are only in person. 
from Monday through Friday. We do have virtual hours on a weekend. Um, most of the meeting simulations, the workshops for badges, we're really kind of forcing students to come back and talk to us in person. And the feedback we're getting from them, they walk in, body language is shoulders are up by the ears, playing with the edge of the sweatshirt, um, hair, glasses. Some of them shake them. I mean, it's a physical manifestation of anxiety. But by the end, they're smiling. Like they remember how to be with people. And so I think it's important for us to, yes, have some virtual options, but also to really realize training wheels. You can do this. You know, you can be face-to-face -face in an office hour and in a team meeting and, and those kinds of things. Question, care reports. So I've been an English professor in CAS since 2008 until 2016 when I went to COGOD. I've probably filled out many dozens of care reports. And I'm interested in the coordinated care model from a faculty standpoint or a staff member that feels like such a black hole. I know that on your end, you're coordinating. Are you hearing from other faculty and other staff members so that you can get a whole picture? But it's frustrating to never really hear back. And I get privacy and I get students may not want to share. But I wonder if there's any thinking about, hey, we're doing better and here's what this student needs and you're you know having a real effect or please try these other things making it a little bit more two-way i apologize for taking all this time but that's oh, not at all it's raymond oh again thank you very much for the feedback um in the short seven weeks that i've been here i think i've heard from at least one faculty member per week about the care reports in the loop around so um um, I am in the process now of talking to my team um, through Jeff Brown, the interim um, AVP uh, in my office to discuss how we are managing the care reports. Uh, I will say that um, from a FERPA standpoint, uh, in managing student cases, there are, there's actually information we can share from a, a, from a partnership and coordinated care standpoint. So for me, I'm uh, interested in examining what, what is it about our culture that led to the current process of managing care reports. I'm also delighted to hear that you are sending in care reports. I've been in um, un universities where uh, faculty do not ever use them. Um, so uh, it's really nice to actually come to a university where faculty are using them and want more information and to see how it connects the dots. Um, so thank you for that. I have heard that uh, as well, so. And if I could just quickly jump in as well, I think this concept that you just brought up around closing the loop applies to many different areas as well. So care reports is certainly the example at hand, but there's also academic alerts, right? And we want to think strategically, you know, also technologically, like how to make that easier for folks, right? The more integrated we become as a campus, I think the easier it will become for us to close the loop and for us to know at any given point, where are our students, right? In, in the resolution process of what's going on. And so I just wanted to take this opportunity to say the coordinated care network will require that closing of the loop and something that we're all invested in making sure will happen in the future. Um, we're going to go to the online group here for a sec. Mac is going to relay the questions to you all. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm relaying a question from someone in the chat. So I'm just going to read out the direct language. Um, so the question is, what about supporting faculty and staff? I'm a TA, and last semester I had a student who had multiple issues. It's not my place to determine if they were lying, but regardless, I gave them the benefit of the doubt and lots of chances, extensions, and support. Then after the final exam, they excused me of having something against them even after all that they did. Luckily, the head professor stepped in and took care of the issue, but it made this person very uh, extremely upset about that. I was so understanding and graded his assignments weeks after they were due, and yet he still said this about me. Where do you draw the line between, and this is the question, <laughs> where do you draw the line between being kind and cognizant but not handholding and holding students accountable for their work? If this happened to a full-time faculty member, what would have been the best course of action? Question. Um, you know, 
I don't know if anyone on the panel feels moved. I'm not seeing anyone feeling moved, to, but but they want to. Yeah. So I can actually pose this to this group. I can weigh in. I mean, I do think that's a balance, right? I think this is, I actually don't believe in balance. Let me take that back. I don't think balance is a thing. I think balance is a moment. I don't think it's a, a sustained state. Um, but I think that is one of the productive tensions of our work. Let me say it that way. Productive because we're constantly going back and forth between these simultaneous commitments. I don't think it's either or, right? So I think, you know, there's always specifics to any given case. You know, I would say that we probably can't speak to without more context, but I appreciate the question. And I do think this is where that partnership is really important. So I would say, it sounds like this person talked with their, um, who they were TA, right? So whoever was the main teacher of the course, but also think about department chairs, program directors, colleagues, partners across the institution, right? Who can be thought partners in these cases? Um, you know, to the extent you're protecting student confidentiality, but we all have challenges in our teaching and in our, in our interactions with students. And so that idea of really being in partnership with each other, I think is essential in this case. That's not a specific answer, but I do think both of these things need to be true. I always think about high expectations and high support as simultaneous commitments, right? When we hold high expectations for students, we have to have high support measures to help them get there, right? So it's not about one or the other. It's about both. Yeah, we have a colleague with a, with a thought, please. Great question to whoever asked that online. Hi, everyone. I'm Natasha Coco Benitez. I teach strategies and stress management. So yes. let's go. Good answerer. Thank you. A couple of things that are on my mind, but I'd like to, to address this. I feel I've noticed in my students and maybe even just the people in this room, confrontation is like uncomfortable for people. And what I practice with my students is just respectful transparency. That's just an honest conversation with a young person that maybe, maybe they've been spoiled their whole life and they're used to saying what they need to get what they, to get ahead. So I did come into contact with students like that, that any little confrontation or pushback really made them uncomfortable. But as an instructor, my role is to really prepare them for the workplace and what's gonna happen when they leave this comfort. So I think we need to think as instructors, what is transparency gonna look like in our classroom, but in a respectful way that honors us? Because my students know exactly. If I was, if a student came to, it would just be an honest conversation. And sometimes you can even read it in their body language, in their response to you, like this is a moment of discomfort, but to hear later on down the line that they respected that difficult conversation, that's all that, that we need. So I think it's just, we need to think about what transparency is gonna look like just really fast, just kind of in, in my role now and in my role at my previous job, saw things like this a lot. And um, there, you know, I, I totally agree, you know, with the issues of transparency and your expectations really, really matter. I try to err on the side of kindness, but there are often going to be, um, you know, there are going to be conflicts. There are going to be some students that file a grievance or, you know, represent something that doesn't seem to be your own reality. And um, I do agree with what Amanda said, you know, talk to your, your people around you. I, I had a grievance years ago in a class that still haunts me because we were never able to come to a good resolution. The student just packed up and left. And that, that's a, that's a missed opportunity, I think, for everybody in, in that sense. And, um, and that still bothers me, right? Because it's the, the ones that you can't come to a good resolution on and maintain the relationship kind of hurt us as people, but we need to be able to talk about those with people we trust and to be able to have psychological safety at work um, and also realize that not every student is going to love everything that we do. Really hard. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate this. Are we on, are, are we moving topics or on this one? It's okay. Yeah, anyone, give me one sec. Anybody want to respond to this piece here in particular? before we go on. Ash, do you want to jump in? Yeah, please. Hey, everyone. Uh, Ashley or Ash Boltershek from uh, the Office of the Dean of Students, and thank you for everything today. Um, one, I want to audit your class because that's where I need to be sitting. So that's, uh, that's the first piece. Um, you know, I think one of the important things that you just shared around the, the like transparent communication and how you're able to do that, I think out of our office, 
we are constantly trying to push students to remember that the thing that they had permission for that one time on September 15th was not a blanket permission for the duration of the semester. And they do not do, and I think it is, it's connected to the anxiety and stress of how do I engage in a difficult conversation that makes me look vulnerable and the amount of stress and anxiety that so many of our students feel behind not wanting to disappoint their faculty member, which I completely respect, and they they build up this own wall for themselves. And so I think the, the work of reminding them with really clear boundaries of like, this is a one-off, or this is this one time, I need you to come back and talk with me about what, what you're feeling and what you're experiencing so that we can continue to work on it. Um, and I do wanna, um, to the earlier comment on uh, care reports and uh, turnaround and sort of following back up and that opening, uh, that open line of communication, um, we always will take information. We will always take, if a reporter reaches out to us who has submitted uh, a care report and you say, I wanted to check in about this student because I'm observing the following or nothing has changed, right? We can work then really specifically on what it is that we are seeing and whether the student has even responded to us. Sometimes you're not seeing a level of intervention because the student is refusing to be intervened with. And so we are unable to be proactive. And I think we see such a large number of reports from faculty both on um, in the, the realm of the care report that is as proactive as possible, right? It's that little oof, the little red flag of something just feels off. And if the student's not willing to reach out with us in a timely way, it's hard to provide that resource, just like all of our campus colleagues. And so we certainly will have those folks who are like, you reached out to me back in February, it's March 2nd. Uh, okay, it's May 15th, my classes have ended, can you please help me? And you all see that too. And so I, I wanna highlight that it is never too little information. It is never something that you need to carry on your own. Our goal is to be as transparent as we possibly can, but also be as collaborative as we can, right? And so we are always willing to take pieces of the puzzle and help try to figure out if there's a way to reshape the landscape that the student is developing for themselves. Um, because if you are seeing something in your classroom, I would almost guarantee that somebody else is also seeing something. And so we get to put those pieces together um, and try to make a, a stronger intervention. Jaris, you want to build on that? Yeah, really quickly, Jaris, if you don't mind, and then we'll go to our colleague. Dean Williams. Um, over here, thank you, yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Jaris Williams, Associate Dean of Students, Officer of the Dean of Students. Just adding on to what Dean Bolchersek just mentioned uh, with regards to care reports, um, every time a faculty or community member submits a care report, uh, our office, someone from our office will send an acknowledgement letter to let that person know, number one, who the report is assigned to, number two, that person's email address and office line. So, if the person who submitted the care report wants to follow up and wants to continue conversations to engage, they have all of that information there. So always, 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 if you submit a care report, you will get an acknowledgement email with all of that information so that we can work collaboratively and not make the reporting uh, feel like a black hole. That's, that's, that's first. Second, we had over 4,000 uh, unique care reports last this past academic year. And so you can imagine with uh, four or five staff members in our office, we won't be able to um, always declaratively report back out about these situations because there's just not enough human power there. But if you reach out to that case manager, that case manager will respond and provide any additional context that's needed to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Taylor's question about this, I don't wanna call it a case study, <laughs> but this specific situation, uh, I would ask myself if I was a faculty member in this situation, two other two additional pieces. Number one, have you been in touch with the Office of the Dean of Students? Was there any previous communication? Dean Bultershek mentioned, we may have sent the email correspondence about a one-off type of a situation. Maybe it was more general, asking for more flexibility. Um, the second part would be um, our academic support and access center. Has, does this student have a registered, have registered disability accommodations? Right. That's that's the next logical thing to kind of think about, because that would maybe grant that student more uh, 
the key word there is a reasonable accommodations possibly through, throughout the semester. And of course that's in context as well too, but the caveat there is you may need to be in touch with our academic support and access center. And then uh, finally, um, you can as a faculty member draw a, a hard line. If there's no accommodations and there's, you you've saw that someone from the office of the Dean of Students office hasn't sent anything, Yes, you're a human as a faculty member. Maybe you try to support that student continually, but you can't say no. Like you can't say this is, I've given you the uh, discretion that I would have. And this is, uh, you know, the, in, the end of the road here in terms of support. So I just wanted to end that part there. Thank you. So I know we're short on time and I saw Gihan had a question as well. I don't know if we have any more online. So why don't we take your comment and question and then Gihan's um, comment or question, and then we can have folks respond to whatever feels okay. the most. Thank you all. I'm Rebecca. I am a disability access advisor in the ASAC. So it's great that he kind of led me into this conversation. I wanted to mention about the question on Zoom that it kind of goes to Raymond and Bridget's point about internal versus external control. Like despite all the help, they may just be jaded in their own individual challenges and don't see that as support. But the fact that they weren't successful in their own vision they could see other people like intentionally attacking them, even though that's not necessarily the case. But what I wanted to ask, which is actually great of the previous comment, um, I'm asking this from a personal perspective and previous experience prior to AU. Um, so I don't know what it's like at AU. So just keep that in mind. Um, but I'm getting my doctorate and my studies are with um, inclusion in the classroom and how faculty you know, see that, how they include students with disabilities and just providing equitable resources in the classroom without seeking accommodations. Um, I'm curious because um, a lot of the research I've read in my uh, dissertation research is a common report from students is that their needs weren't met by a professor. They were just deferred to the ASAC of that individual school. There are documentation requirements that a lot of students who do see mental health issues, they just can't meet those requirements for financial reasons, time, you know, convenience, whatever it may be. I'm curious how we as a university are including disability and inclusion and the intersectionalities of diversity. How are we educating our faculty to be inclusive in the classroom, have that flexibility that the individual in Zoom um, mentioned without just deferring them to the ASAC where they may not even meet the requirements to get our support. Great Thank question. You. Thank you. And Gihan, let's take your question and then those of us on the panel can, can respond. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, mine was more in the way of a comment that actually relates some to the things that have already been asked. Um, I'm Gihan Fernando. I'm the Assistant Vice Provost for the Career Center located right below us here. I had a very easy commute for lunch today. Um, I wanted, first of all, endorse everything that Karan said, um, especially we see the exact same thing with employers. Um, it's not that grades are unimportant. It's just that they're not as important as they were. And that um, what are sometimes disparagingly referred to as soft skills are often the most desired skills. Picking up on some of the things that were said on the panel, I would, and, and in some of this conversation that we're having, I would encourage faculty in their classes to, in, to be uh, more challenging of students rather than less, not to accommodate a sense of like, you're not good at that, so we'll sort of dumb it down if you like. Um, so Bridget talked about like teamwork assignments, right? And that many people have them. Students hate teamwork assignments doesn't mean they shouldn't have them. They're tough to grade. I know CTRL has ways, ways to manage that and to give you advice on how to do that. And there are so many other such values that we need to, part of what we're doing is educating our students here in the broader context. And those are among the skills. If they're not as good at the people skills that we're talking about, um, that has much broader implications. And I think it's part of our responsibility to be thinking about that. So that's my comment. Yeah, thank you, Gihan, and thank you, Rebecca. So I know we're we're coming to the last thirty seconds. So so any panelists who can very pithily respond to two very important and large questions, please. Yeah, well, and and I I think with what Rebecca and what Gihan are saying, like I I see some of those coming together with universal design for learning, and I I'm still learning what CTRL is, but you know I'm an educational researcher as well, and 
they got good stuff. Okay. Everything I've seen, I'm like, yep, 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 yep. So they get, you know, the Bridget checkbox of approval. Not that that matters that much. Um, but you know, whenever, whenever we're able to do things like, um, whenever you give verbal assignments in class, write it down, you know, give it, give it to students on campus, what you actually expect, pull back the curtain. Um, you know, where they know why it is that you want them to do something. Why is it that I want you to be able to work in teams? Employers always say, this is something that that we need. You have to be able to work in teams, right? I mean, we we worked together on figuring some of these out. And, you know, a few of us at the table have not yet been here that long. Um, it, you know, and so why is it that we want to do those things? And so I think whenever we're looking at supporting students who have documented disabilities, there are also a number of different neurodivergent ways that we all operate and um, being able to be as transparent as possible is something that really matters. And I, I also love what Gihan said about, you know, there, there is a bar, you know, and, and, or, but maybe it's not a bar because that student's not a gymnast. Maybe to them, a bar means something totally different, you know? I did not mean to go there. I just did. Um, anyway, the but really at the end of the presentation, uh, uh, yeah, it, only if it were like five o'clock. Um, but you know, but being able to like all the research on stereotype threat, imposter syndrome, et cetera. I put this out in my newsletter a couple of weeks ago. That to those in UES who might read, might not. I don't know. Um, but the idea, it's not that you know we we don't expect you to learn and grow here. Or anything goes. Instead, it's you know, we, we do have standards. This is why you're getting feedback in your learning to help you continue to improve because perfection is an asymptote, right? We are never going to hit it. We are always learning and growing. And as good as we become, we can always continue to learn and grow. And that's why I go back to the thing that I said, don't be stingy with praise um, because students don't always get a lot of praise. We don't always get a lot of praise. Jimmy says nice things to me almost every day and I really appreciate it. Um, and I try to say nice things back to him, you know, and so, so I lost my train of thought, but, but I'm being quiet good, now. That was thank a good you. place to end, which is to say praise to the panel, praise to the audience. Thank you all for this. Looking forward to more. Thank you.